One of my earliest memories is from when I was about five years old, right here in Oakland. It was Rosh Hashanah, one of the most important holidays in the Jewish year, and I was going to services with my family. Surrounded by hundreds of other members of my synagogue, I remember running my fingers through my chair's dark brown upholstery and sitting calmly as I listened to the chorus of Hebrew prayers, prayers that seemed to fill up the temple ceiling above me. Now, despite their predictable tune, at just five years old, these were prayers that I couldn't yet understand. Now, after services, I do remember taking a walk with my two moms in the large park just a few blocks away from our synagogue. All of us were still dressed in the distinctly Jewish clothing, kippahs and talises that we wore to services. Every year, the three of us would make a long circle around the park. And to this day, those walks after synagogue are some of my happiest and most meaningful memories. Just recently, though, another Jewish family was taking a similar walk in Lower Manhattan's Battery Park in New York City. The family passed by a man who, seeing that the family was wearing clearly Jewish clothing, clothing similar to what my family wore on our walk through the park, turned around and drew a knife from his coat. The man slashed both parents and their one-year-old child all across their faces. Now, I would never have been able to comprehend a story like that at the age that I was in those early memories. But now I understand that that family truly could have been my family. Now, after I had my bar mitzvah, when I was 13 years old, I loved to go to regular Saturday morning services in my synagogue. By that time, I could understand what the prayers meant, and I probably loved to attend those services more than anyone else in my family. But I would try to get them to come along as often as I could. By that time, I have a little sister, and she is five years old. Every Saturday, I incentivize her to get up early and walk to services with me, usually with the promise of some pastry treat or ice cream later in the afternoon. Now, every Saturday, we would get up and walk to services together. And if my friends were there, she would usually sit with us. But if more of her friends were there than mine, she would ask if she could run off and go sit with them across the room. Now, obviously, I preferred when she sat with me. But regardless, those mornings in synagogue with her are absolutely the most meaningful mornings that I have ever had. Every week, synagogue was a grounding highlight for me. But the morning of October 27th, 2018, everything changes. Because that morning I read that a gunman had entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and fatally shot 11 Jewish worshipers. I read that the victims were sitting peacefully in Saturday morning synagogue before they were murdered. Services just like those that I looked forward to so much every week, and just like those that I planned to attend on that very day. Now, every day that I go to synagogue after that, I just, I can't sit still. I listen to the daily teachings and I sing along as best I can to the prayers in Hebrew, but no matter what I do, I find my eyes darting around the room, darting at the exits. I look at the exit in front of me, adjacent to the podium where the rabbi stands. I turn around and I look at the exit behind my head, closer but more open. And I wonder, which one will I run to if a gunman enters the room and starts shooting? Will it be quicker to dart forward, ducking behind chairs and benches as I try to make an escape, or more effective to turn around and run for the closer exit behind my head? Now, regardless, I was terrified. And out of all these plans, all of these blueprints for survival that I felt like I had to make at just 13 years old, there's one that I remember more clearly than any of the rest. And it's probably the most important. As I heard the Saturday morning prayers fill up the room above me, and I tried desperately to sit still in my chair, and feel grounded, my mind's eye was filled with chaos. In my mind's eye, I saw bullets flying. I saw them tearing through the synagogue's plaster walls, ripping through the wooden table on which the Torah rested. I heard them shattering the stained glass windows of the synagogue, 
on either sides of the room. And I wonder, with bullets flying and bodies cluttering the floor, would I have time to run across the room, grab my little sister in my arms, and take her to safety without the both of us being killed? I was 13 years old, and I couldn't sit for five minutes in what used to be my place of safety, not without planning on how I might have to save my little sister from death. I was so, so scared. And in 2018, after the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, many Jews in the country were thinking along similar lines. That year, Jews made up around 2% of the American domestic population. But despite being such a tiny minority, nearly 60% of religiously based hate crimes targeted Jews. That year, there were nearly 1,300 of these crimes. But anti-Semitism in our country has actually only gotten worse since 2018. In 2019, there were nearly 1,000 anti-Semitic hate crimes committed against the Jewish people alone. Now, that's an average of nearly three every single day. That's three hate crimes committed against the tiny Jewish minority of the United States every day with no days off for a year. And despite 18 months of lockdowns and restrictions, anti-Semitism in our country has actually remained at near record levels until now. In fact, however likely I was as a scared 13-year-old kid in synagogue, or any other Jewish person in the country was to be the victim of a hate crime in 2018, we would be even more likely to be a victim of that hate crime today. Over 10% more likely, according to the Anti-Defamation League. Now, this increase in anti-Semitic hate does not stand alone. It's part of an identifiable statistical trend. Four out of the last five years, there has been an increase in the number of hate crimes in our country at large an increase right in step with the increase in anti-Jewish hate crimes. Now, this statistic is seldom reported or analyzed on a national stage, but that doesn't make it any less true. It still tells us something, especially when you consider that when the amount of anti-Jewish crimes were decreasing in our country, say from 2008 to 2013, the number of total hate crimes were decreasing right in step with them. The data shows us clearly, more clearly than we ever have imagined, that anti-Semitism, the fight against anti-Semitism, is an intersectional fight. It's a fight for everyone. Now, it's no easy task, and it never has been. It's no short road. But ultimately, it's a road that must be taken together. Crushing domestic anti-Semitism is something that we can do in the 21st century. It's a fight that we can win. Now, how can we win it? Well, firstly, through education. The United, Nations, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, is a subordinate branch of the UN that focuses on shaping international educational policy. Now, UNESCO has determined the number one most effective tool that most of its member states have to combat anti-Semitism. Now, they've determined that that tool is education. It's time for the United States, with this conclusion drawn, to utilize education, especially through calculated reform of history and ethnic studies curriculums, to combat anti-Semitism in our country. Now, how best do we go about doing this? Through targeting ignorance. The myths of Jewish hegemonic pursuit and the undue possession of power in Jewish hands have proved central to anti-Semitic dogma in our country time and time again. But these are myths that education has the power to dispel. By educating our nation's students on the history of the Jewish diaspora's continued oppression, when Jews were expelled from England in 1290, murdered in Spain in 1492, slaughtered in the pogroms of Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries, and tortured in the Holocaust, we can dispel the myths that the Jewish people control too much power in our society. We can dispel the myth that the Jewish people are an enemy to be feared. These are myths that are based off ignorance. And the best thing that we can do to fight ignorance is ramp up our anti-anti-Semitism education. Now, ignorance often fuels hatred, 
and hatred often fuels violence. So no matter how simple this education may seem, no matter how early we start, it will be the first step to fighting not only casual anti-Semitism, but extremist anti-Semitism overall. Now, structural changes, especially in our education systems, are crucial. But on a personal level, fighting anti-Semitism is something that we can do as well. Now, right now, it's no secret that many of us are stretched incredibly thin. It's burdensome to think about taking on another part of our society that we need to examine, another cause to fight for, another goal to care about. But I believe that combating anti-Semitism is a responsibility that all of us share. It's a moral imperative for, imperative for every one of us. And by far, the most common forms of anti-Semitism in our country is not murders or assaults, but less conspicuous everyday forms of discrimination and harassment. Now this casual anti-Semitism, if left unchecked, has the potential to evolve into real acts of hatred and violence. Casualism evolves into extremism. That's why it's the job of all of us to stand up to anti-Semitism when others stand down, to combat all types of anti-Semitic anti hate that we see in our daily lives. Because for many of us, we know that we see it. Silence is always complacency. And that does not just go for fighting anti-Semitism. The data shows us that the safety of the Jewish community in the United States is deeply linked with the safety of nearly every other oppressed group in our country. A desire to harm Jews in our nation is deeply linked with the desire to harm the black community a desire to harm the Muslim community, a desire to harm the LGBTQ community, and a desire to harm the Asian community. And we all would be foolish if we thought that that's where the list stopped. Fighting anti-Semitism intersectionally should be the goal that we all have. And like I said before, it is truly an achievable one. As history has shown us, a society that tolerates hate against Jews is never a society that just tolerates hate against Jews. It's a society that tolerates hate. This was as true in 1943 as it is today. But unlike the Jews of 1943, we all have an opportunity through education and personally combating every type of anti-Semitism and every type of hate that we see in our lives we have an opportunity to build a society where hate has no room to fester in any of its forms. In this time, we have the opportunity, we have the resources to build a society where parents do not have to fear for the lives of their children and where brothers do not have to fear for the lives of their sisters. Our collective work of fighting anti-Semitism will build a society that does better. Better for everyone. Thank you.